it's very hard to describe how systems actually work when you're talking about societies where systems have people in them and the interactions. It's hard to understand. There, there has to be a lot of assumptions made in certain situations. But this provides for little understanding. It provides for little stability. And you can't really be sure about any of these things. Yet we're dealing with the restructure of a society, right? We're dealing with people being put in jail or, or beaten or ostracized from social media because of so-called racism. We're being directly affected and influenced for things that we can't truly define, as well as entire countries are being told to stay inside, to wear masks, to do this, to do that, to limit themselves in so many different ways, all based on something we cannot necessarily prove or something that we cannot necessarily have a, a full understanding of. It's these ghosts that exist. And my argument here is that they're only able to exist when you have this type of foundation of understanding. When you have this perception, when you perceive reality and the world from this type of thinking or lack thereof, these things are possible. If we were in a world based on eternal truth of objective truth and morality and absolutism, proper use of the scientific method, knowing it's flawed, knowing that it changes, willing to change our ideas based on new evidence found. If we were able to address reality from these perspectives, none of this would exist. Do you think systematic racism, oppressive system would exist? Do you think this, this COVID phantom menace would exist? Of course it, it wouldn't because they couldn't be proven. They couldn't be properly proven through truth. So this is interesting to me. It's an abstraction. We're living in a world of abstractions which directly relates to the virtual reality which is extremely abstract. We're slowly getting further and further away from the real material reality and we're more and more so taking on a simulation by way of subterfuge which you had mentioned before which is brilliant and it's exactly what we're, we're dealing with right now. The, the mixture of the two, the, the playing, the interplay of the two. And this reminds me of Thomas Sowell's concept of the cosmic justice. He calls progressive social justice cosmic justice. And I love this term. It's, it's great because what he means by cosmic is that it can't necessarily be proven. It, it can't be tested. It is yet to materialize. It's not tangible. It's cosmic. And it, it exists though. It's mutable. And it's mu that's where I was going. It's mutable. Okay. It's contingent. Imagine living in a world of this constant state of contingency and mutable events. It's madness. It's, it's for crazy making. It's chaos magic. It's all of these things wrapped up together. So what we have ultimately is it's symbolic. It's ethereal. And it's easy to understand why all of this nonsense and madness and fairy tale like stuff exists right now. Because this is the foundation behind this type of thinking. I would also refer to Postman's concept of the symbolic world and also uh, Heidegger's concept of the world picture. All of these different philosophers had different ways of explaining what this is exactly. It's, it's just very, very interesting to me because what we have here is contra a contradictory situation. So for instance, the systemic racism, the, the symbolic ethereal menace in the system that's oppressing black people, right? It's an oppressor minus the oppressor. And what we have with pan the pandemic, COVID, it's a pandemic minus the virus. You see this cognitive dissonance? Do you, you see this contradictory nature of it? And this is what we get with this relativistic, pragmatic view is contradiction. Literally the author of confusion is what we are trying to grasp right now day to day. The oppressor minus the oppressor because the system is a system. It's abstract. Who are you going to blame? You know, they say it's a white system, but there is no particular person to blame or group even, especially when you regard all the different racial and ethnic groups that played a key role in the development of, of the American nation. You can't just say white people. Perfect explanation because as long as it's amorphous, as long as you can't pin it down, yes, you can just make it up as you go. There it is. And what, what are you implying when you say making it up as you go? Situational. Exactly. Short range. Purposes, exactly. emotion, scientism. It's like mind blowing when you think about how this is working and how effective it is on this on the masses that are so lost and confused here because it's it's literally a, a, a structure of confusion that has no real order from the outset. And we we're, we're in the streets, we're, we're in our homes trying to figure out, we're trying to make sense of all of this. And it's completely irrelevant to even try to make sense of it because it's never supposed to make sense. It doesn't, it inherently lacks sense. <laughs> Everybody wants to be good. They want to, whatever that means, people want to be good. But how do you do that? And how do you live in the truth? You have to be consistent. This is an article from uh, a website called The Critic, and it's written by Peter Hitchens. This is the well-known atheist Christopher Hitchens' brother. Peter Hitchens happens to be uh, a Christian. And the title is called Democracy Muzzled. Now, here's, here are the points. I'm, just, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to give some points from the article. The long retreat of law, reason, and freedom has now turned into a rout. 
It was caused by many things. The mob hysteria, which flowered after the death of Princess Diana. And according to Hitchens here, that's where he identifies the beginning of this. And the evisceration of education. The spread of intolerant speech codes designed to impose a single opinion on the academy and journalism. The incessant state-sponsored panics over terror. The collapse and decay of institutions and traditions. These have all at last flowed together into a single force. And we seem, we all today, we seem to be powerless against them. Absurdly, the moment at which they have achieved maximum power is accidental. A wild, out-of-proportion panic response to a real but limited epidemic. Use the term panic, use epidemic. So it, the, the point here is that we really haven't seen anything like what we're living through right now. And how has it been promoted? Hitchens says here very plainly, propaganda. What is propaganda? Propaganda is not there to make you agree with it. It is there to tell you that you are powerless against it. That's the goal of propaganda. Now, this is a very good point. Now, when you talk about debate and the idea that reason seems to be uh, a casualty and logic and, and thinking well, being able to debate an issue is a casualty today. It is increasingly a disadvantage today in any debate to actually know anything about the subject under discussion. That's a great point because anytime you start anyone starts to make a real point today, they just get shouted down. Once you once people realize you know what you're talking about, they just shout you down. The obvious aspect of the face mask decrees has so far eluded those who have only just begun to live as citizens of a servile state. Yet I remain amazed that so many either cannot see or pretend not to see the enormous symbolism of a population compelled by fear of the state to sacrifice much of their individuality and to adopt a form of dress which is associated with submission. Remember in a, in a stream days and I did a couple months ago, we pointed out how the mask is a religious garment, much like the yarmulke. He says here, I sometimes wonder where all the amateur Freudians are, normally so ready to offer analysis of my failings at moments such as this. You know, a cigar is sometimes merely a cigar. But a mask is seldom just a mask. The COVID muzzle demands an extraordinary act of personal self-cancellation. So you see what we got now? It's not just cancel culture is not just uh, the mob canceling somebody. Today, you're going to cancel yourself. The COVID muzzle demands an extraordinary act of personal self-cancellation. No doubt, this uh, self-abrogation and self-canceling appeals to some. Look and you will see that some wear them with a sort of pride, right? Virtue signal. But but most look baffled and captive, as if they're peering through a slot in a wall behind which they have found themselves trapped. And the constant sight of streets, on streets, in stations, in shops, and on TV, of thousands of others, likewise suppressed, maintains the fear, perpetuates. It perpetuates itself. Alarm and panic, which the government must now preserve for the immediate future. Those who think that this is scaremongering need to read an astonishing document still far too little known to the general public. It is a paper submitted to the government's own SAGE committee on March 22nd of this year, 2020. And it has the heading Persuasion, and the key segment says this, Perceived Threat. A substantial number of people still do not feel sufficiently personally threatened. It could be that they are reassured by the low death rate in their demographic group, although levels of concern may be rising. Having a good understanding of the risk has been found to be positively associated with the adoption of COVID-19 social distancing measures in Hong Kong. The perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased among those who are complacent. The perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased among those who are complacent. Using hard-hitting emotional messaging. To be effective, this must also empower people by making clear the actions that they can take to reduce the threat. Part of the solution. Documents of this kind, that's the little piece from that. And I'm telling you, that's interesting. It's from the SAGE committee. And I'll put a link to this article so you can find this for yourself. This is fascinating. But documents like this one that I just read a piece from are not supposed to get out. You're not supposed to be able to read that. This is meant for those who are inside to read. In better times than these and uh, with active and critical media, this particular passage with its clear implication that this was the task of the state to scare us into compliance might have led to the fall of the government. As it is, you will struggle to find mentions of it 
in the British national press. And he's writing from the perspective he's in the UK. They are there, but they are hard to find and not only and not on any daily front pages. This is not because of censorship or because of any kind of collective action. It is because most people, having lived all their lives in relaxed freedom, are quite unable at this point, fat and happy, I call it, quite are, are unable now to believe what is in front of their eyes. And he says here it is a Chestertonian paradox with Chesterton himself, uh, which Chesterton himself never wrote. A government changing the nature of the state successfully and without opposition because nobody can believe what they're seeing. And so everybody politely ignores it. So those who think that the face mask will soon be over might like to recall the irrational precautions of airport security. For example, with the body scanners at the airports, they're still here. But now, here's the last piece. Now we have a new fear, just like we were, days we just mentioned a moment ago. This thing is amorphous. It has no real substance. It exists in the hyper real. It's not in reality. It's not in, it's not objective truth. It can't be measured. It just exists in the hyper real. But today we have, like terrorism, was the same thing. Terrorism was this amorphous enemy that they could always change, just like climate change. It's the same thing. It's something that they can, it used to be called global warming. Then it was called climate change. And now it's called climate crisis. It's always changing because it's not real. But now a new fear, even more shapeless, invisible, perpetual, and hard to defeat. How can you ever eliminate a virus? Uh, more shapeless, invisible, and perpetual than Al Qaeda or ISIS has arrived in our midst. There is almost no bad action it cannot be used to excuse, including the strangling of an already shaky economy for which those eccentric or lucky enough to still be working will pay for decades. Millions have greeted this new peril as an excuse to abandon a liberty they did not really care much about in the first place. As a nation, we now produce more fear than we can consume locally hiding in our homes as civil society evaporates. We queue up happily to hand in our freedom and to collect our muzzles and our digital IDs. And those of us who cry out until we're hoarse to say that this is a catastrophe are met with shrugs from the chattering classes and snarls of just put on the damn mask from the mob. If I hadn't despaired long ago, in other words, if I hadn't given up on society a long time ago, I would be despairing now. And that's the end. That's a pretty accurate take. It is comforting to hear someone who has access to mainstream media speaking in this way. Oh yeah, that, that was just great. I mean, we need more of these types of discussions that actually utilize uh, proper thinking methods and appreciate the purpose and meaning behind getting to the truth, the actual reality of truth itself which clearly is vanishing and i think that's one of the key points here is that we are being pushed away from our ability to to actually think because i think we're being moved towards a type of artificial intelligence where we will be connected to the internet of things and we will no longer think for ourselves everything will be downloaded everything will be different forms of references for us to make decisions and we're already partially doing that with our applications we're already partially giving over our human I'd say our God-given human nature, we're, we're handing over many aspects of that to technology. And unfortunately, we're being prepared for this new artificial intelligence mass population that's on its way, especially once implants become a norm and biochips are within the populace and connected to the Internet of Things. You're no longer going to be human, for one. You'll no longer be a child of God. You'll be something else. And you'll no longer be you. As, as Unplugum says, they want to make you you a new you this this idea of, of duality they they want to create a second version of you that becomes the you winnicott and many other psychologists would call it the false self referring to the i'd say pandemic of narcissism or at least endemic or epidemic of narcissism here in america that's where this is going a type of atomized hubris type of situation and uh, what's interesting to me especially when we're talking about these these different forms of communitarianism that relies on relativism right because they can't really back any of their movements with foundational truth, eternal truth. Everything is emotional. Oh, we need to take care of the environment. Why? Well, we just do it. It's it's just the right thing to do. You know why? Need, yeah, exactly. Why? I always beat them with why. Uh, why is universal health care a good idea? Tell me why. Because I say so. That's because that's all. That's as far as they can go. That's as far as they can go. They can give no true, no no true foundation for that, it, it, or it feels right. I, I would feel bad otherwise.
It's an emotional record. We could look at uh, why should we save lives? People die every day. Why? And I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but why, why should we save lives? Why should we try to save the world? Why? What gives humans value? They can't answer these questions. So it makes sense why all of this is actually leading to the destruction of humanity. And in fact, it's the polar opposite of what they claim. We are going into a post-civilization where humans will no longer be human. And in fact, the only humans left, they will try to wipe out. And when I say the only humans left, I mean the ones not plugged into the Borg or, or the, the Internet of Things. Those, those of us that don't want to be biochipped, they're going to try to, to get rid of us in, in some fashion, whether that be literally or they just ostracize us to a remote land space and we're completely uh, driven outside of, of the quote-unquote society. I guess we could start wrapping this up with this idea of where we're going with this. What is this? What is this new society coming? We understand the system coming is, is technocracy. We understand uh, big tech in cahoots with global government and environmentalism and NGOs and think tanks, the academy, uh, science, we, we understand that this coalition is coming together to bring in the technocracy. It's clear, but what communities are coming? What type of people are coming? What, what, what type of social dynamic? What's, what's coming? And, and this term you, you brought up, uh, neo-barbarianism. I think is very interesting because we are going and I, th I think this directly speaks to this idea of a new dark age you know we're going back into this barbaric type of, uh, of, of function where we're we're, uh, we're really reaching back into old ways of, of interacting with but with new tools it's it's a paradox it's very interesting how this is all playing out but let's speak a little bit more to wrap up here about this idea of neo -bar barbarianism and how this worldview or this uh, epistemology of relativism and pragmatism uh, plays a part well typically today we we like to uh we like to use the term we're living in a with the new age and all that the new age ideas and ideologies typically we say we're living in a, a this neo-pagan society and and that's true to a certain degree uh because pagans at least although they have nothing to ground their morality in they do at least think that there is morality at least they're convinced that morality exists barbarians on the other hand on the left side of the column they're purely sensual everything that serves me right now in the moment uh, they're not actually interested in anything eternal any eternal truth it is about the moment and so really what we see today is things like uh, the uh, abortion on demand without questions let's grow the abortion and body parts for sale industry it really comes from a group of people who are amoral they have no morals they don't un even care that this is not it, whatever increases the profit margin or or whatever furthers their agenda for some type of uh, one world system is what they'll do so they, they lack morals altogether so there's a difference between being purposefully immoral and then just not even having any morals whatsoever uh, and that is in my opinion it, it's barbarianism we're bringing back barbarianism and as Daisy said, this has to do with subjectivity. It's all about what I, I need right now in the moment. If I need to kill you right now because uh, I want what you have, I'm going to do that. Or if you disagree with my political perspective, I'm going to have to s smack you over the head with a baseball bat. Or burn down your business because I don't care. I'm going to make my point. It's anti-human. And we talk about humanism a lot in negative terms. But, you know, if, you, if you're going to be around uh, atheists or unbelievers, you hope at least that they're humanists. They do believe that objective morality exists. Exist, or, or if they don't believe objective morality exists, at least they do have an idea that, as flawed as it is, that well-being is important. Barbarian doesn't care. And so, it, as you said here, it's missing value, importance. There's no uh, respect, human essence. And in fact, as I said a minute ago, there is no consistency. There's no foundation. People are not responsible to one another in a barbarian society, in this neo-barbarian society. And in fact, I'd like to make a comment here about anarchy. In my life, I was wooed and seduced by the idea of anarchy. But because I was, uh, you know, going through my period where I was just very skeptical about government. And I still am. That hasn't changed very much. But I look at it from a different perspective now because anarchy is certainly no answer. And we see from uh, Romans chapter 13 where, where we, we understand very clearly that we're called to submit to the authorities because as Christians, we're not troublemakers. We reflect Jesus Christ and we preach him crucified and, and resurrected. We preach the gospel. We carry the gospel. We don't cause trouble. We don't bother nobody. And so that, that's our goal. But we respect these authorities up until 
until the point where they ask us to do or have or, or try to compel us to do that which God hasn't allowed us to do or they prevent us from doing that which God has commanded us to do and in that case we are perfectly within our Christian worldview and within our moral framework to disobey a silly law like we see in, in California where churches aren't allowed to meet inside but John MacArthur at his church they're meeting he stood up to the authority because what they asked him to do went specifically against what God had commanded they had asked him to do something that went against specifically against God's will and it had nothing and, and John MacArthur has said it many times I wouldn't do this if there was really a threat but the definition of pandemic hasn't even been met worldwide for a pandemic the definition for a pandemic to exist you need one to three percent of the people affected whether it's a virus or whatever that's how you think about that issue am I honoring eternal truth or this that serves me in the moment and so I would call this society we have today it's a neo-barbarian society for many reasons but ones I've named about abortion on demand we sacrifice way more children today than those you know nasty ancients did in, in Canaan were way worse we do it in the millions just in this country only every year so I see that as barbarian that we're going we're probably moving out of this now I wouldn't I wouldn't have said this a year ago but right now it feels like now we're moving out of the neo-pagan era we're going into just straight up barbarianism yes and I think it's gonna get worse the more people are pressed like we are now uh, lockdowns and you get the feeling that their, their liberties are being uh, mitigated people are going to get more and more angry so you're going to see out of the people who don't have the Christian worldview to stand on they're going to start getting angry and acting out in a way that is going to really look barbaric oh, yes. that's that's what's on the way that's I think what will be what some describe as a, a civil war that's the shape it's going to come in in response to these things you're mentioning here it's it's on the way and uh, there will be very little stopping it because this is the direction things are going it's it's no way around it and you know be very weary about equality the concept equality or the the critical theories drive of changing the world because we have to understand one thing of course is man has fallen and I think it, only from the Christian worldview only a Christian to really understand the depth of this but mankind is fallen hence uh, we're going to have issues we're going to have inequality we're going to have struggle and different forms of tragedy there there never will be a utopia or system that works perfectly there, there never will be equality you couldn't end racism just as it as you couldn't end murder it's foolishness to even imagine or, or think or embark on some type of mission to accomplish this with that in mind we realize well you'd have to be very inconsistent in your world view you would have to be very confused to take that position and I think we've provided this, a, a decent understanding of what that position is or at least what the foundation of that position is uh, mainly it being relativism but also be very weary about this movement of equality and world change and saving the world because of course the foundation is weak built on sand and unstable but also realize what does that really mean what is that really saying to make things equal you would essentially have to topple whatever exists for one but also if things are going to be equal we have to consider redistribution now you brought up a really good concept earlier regarding fairness and i think you had uh, referred to jonathan and his his book on uh, just the liberal versus conservative moral dichotomy and how different worldviews different perspectives political and philosophical perceive fairness differently so what one group might see as fair might not be the same fairness as the other group and what would we use to figure out what fair truly is if you just think of this if there was just you and me in the world and let's take the idea idea of well-being for example let's say our idea of well-being doesn't agree well who's right? right and that's that's essentially the idea it has to be transcendent it has to be outside of man you need eternal truth to come to any stable and consistent idea of what is fair what is good what is right what should be and what we're dealing with here is a faction a movement an organization a spirit that's dealing with these concepts with these ideas of change of redistribution of humane uh, progression we're dealing with a faction that aims to do this yet at the same time we're dealing with a group that doesn't have the proper tools nor the proper foundation to address these issues so from the outset this thing is completely flawed now as Christians it's very easy for us to comprehend this we understand who has been given this earth we understand that but just speaking to the multitude speaking to the general pop all you have to do is take a, a, a gander into who's behind the world changing events of the day and, and look at 
their foundation, look at their philosophies, look at how they perceive knowledge, how they perceive truth. When all you see is relativism, you should be very weary of this idea of equality because what it leads to is a type of slavery, a type of communism, and I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, if we want to change the world because it's oppressive, because it's racist, because it's abusive, and there's this white supremacy and all of this, if, if we want to change that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to destroy it first. But once it's destroyed, you have to rebuild it, right? You have to create this new world, this new equal world. And how is that going to be done? How are you going to redistribute things when you, when you don't have a stable system to know who gets what? No one gets anything. That's how you make it equal. Everyone has nothing. If some people have too much, no one gets anything. And that's where this is going. That's where this is headed ultimately. The majority of people that promote this stuff are addressing it from emotional places only because they're not using the logic and reason and spirit to understand what this is really going to produce. It can't be consistent. In that worldview, it cannot be consistent. It can't. And I, I think that's what we need to pay closer attention to. If some will have more than others. That's a problem. It's problematic. It's oppressive. And since we don't really have a system to properly administer things in an equal fashion, because that's impossible, especially coming from their foundation. Well, we're just going to take away everything. And then what you're going to have is a massive generic gray state of plebs and proles, us. And uh, basically, you'll have an elite state, a technocratic state, an oligarchy of technocrats, specialists, scientists. A you'll have a prescribed society, a brave new world. Yes, a brave new world. Intelligentsia. They will be the capitalists and the party together, the elite state that get to enjoy the fruits of the world because they're the ones, they're the administrators. So they're above this idea of equality. Their superiority isn't perceived as inequality because they have a specialized role. They're the administrators, so in a sense they're free from that moral argument. Yet everyone else in society is at the lowest of the lows because they have to keep it that way so we are all equal. And that's that's really what this is, is headed towards. This new dark age, it's going to be this new type of monarchy, if you will. The philosopher kings and scientistic kings amongst the peasants. Tear it all down. Everyone's equal. But what are you going to replace it with? And people don't know. And so the, to the people out there, when you hear this and you get anxious, because or, or, or you, you may instinctually say, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of bunk because you don't want it to be true. Well, understand your anxiety is justified, but there is an ultimate eternal truth. When you're in that ultimate eternal truth, you will find peace because you will know, unlike the others who have no goal in mind, therefore no purpose. It's just change, change, change. Change it to something today, we'll have to change it to something else again tomorrow. But when you're in the Christian world, when you're in Christ, Christ is in you, and this is objectively true, then you have the worldview that's true. Then you have peace because you understand the goal. So you need, don't, you just need not be worry don't fret because jesus christ overcame the world and because he's risen from the dead we have hope and we can show it to be objectively true the reason logic and evidence those of us who are christians all we need is the holy spirit but for those who have rejected god or need more evidence it's there don't fall for the trap that there is no evidence or that it's just wild claims find yourself a good apologist who knows how to knows how to present these arguments and you'll understand if you're like me you needed evidence you needed something more if you're like me you're rebellious a little rebel heart and i needed evidence i needed someone to show me and i found it and then i understood wait a minute it is reasonable to believe in god and it is reasonable to follow jesus christ because it can all be shown to be objectively true and it is the only world that can possibly be true because it answers all of the important questions so if you're bothered if these things worry you and they cause anxiety in you because they do me i mean this is a weird time well just understand that there is there's hope because there is an objective truth there's an objective morality and you can live in it right now it's just a choice that you have to make amen to that i don't think i could end the show any better